All right, uh, we're starting a little late, but not too late. Uh, I'll give you some intro. So I'm Jason Gilman. I'm from a small company called Element 84. I'm going to talk to you today about natural language geocoding. Uh, a little bit about Element 84 first. We're a small, woman-owned company. Uh, we work with public, private sector companies, uh, commercial and government side. We develop things like geospatial data processing pipelines uh, and applications that can help answer big questions about our health, infrastructure, and changing planet. It's about big questions. Like the reason that we all do what we do is we are trying to answer questions. And like every geospatial project begins with a quest for answers. And we're getting today to the point where with generative AI that we can actually start to think about directly answering users' questions that they express in natural language. So users have questions, like medical questions, like where are the current cases of Lyme disease within 20 miles of Boulder, Colorado? Or uh, real estate questions, what properties are for sale on the waterfront in Charleston? Or urban planning, is school su funding sufficient near low-income housing around the Seattle Business District? Or ecological, identify protected wetlands within five kilometers of the coastline near Monterey Bay, California. So all of these have uh, one thing in common, or at least one, and that's they all refer to a specific place on the earth. The user is expressing some area in natural language to describe that. Um, at Element 84, we're like a lot of people trying to build things that can answer these questions. And so one thing that we need to be able to do is take these natural language descriptions and convert them into a real polygon. And so we came up with a technique to do that we call natural language geocoding. So we can take a phrase like within 10 kilometers of the coast of the Iberian Peninsula and be able to convert it into just that specific polygon. So you see that uh, blue area that's outlining the Iberian Peninsula, the, the mainland part of, uh, uh, sorry, the Spain and Portugal part of mainland Europe. If you're familiar with like traditional geocoding, it's like taking this to the next level. So if you're using OpenStreetMap, you're doing geocoding, you're typing in an address, you're getting a, a point back. Um, and we can do this all the time in OpenStreetMap. And one of the great things about OpenStreetMap uh, is that you, there's also polygons here. And this is one of the things that we rely on to make natural language geocoding work. We're using the Nominatum API on the back end to do this. And so I can show you. Here's an example uh, in our demo for natural language geocoding, Salt Lake City, you get the same thing. But we can go beyond that. So you can say Salt Lake City east of the airport. And we can you know, figure out from context, what airport are they talking about? It's the Salt Lake City airport. Get the particular boundary of that and get Salt Lake City east of that. We can do things like conjunctions. So Salt Lake City and West Valley City. We're getting the combined area of them together uh, and other ones like bound like buffers. So if a user says around Salt Lake City, within three miles of Salt Lake City, within 5.2 kilometers, we can translate that into real place on the Earth. And this can even go more complicated, where you can say something like, within a few miles of Salt Lake City, West Va Valley City, and Mill Creek, except for the airport, uh, we're taking the polygons from each one of those places, joining them together, adding the buffer, cutting out the airport, and it works pretty quickly, too. Uh, I don't have a demo to show today, but uh, you can trust me on that a bit. How does it work? Right, so you're all guessing, like we're talking about generative AI, like we're using large language models to do this. Um, and we are, but large language models on their own aren't enough. I can go into ChatGPT and ask it to give me the uh, buffer, you know, the kilometer thing around the coast of the Iberian Peninsula, and ChatGPT will generate a GeoJSON polygon for you, and it tells you this is just a simple example, uh, it, but you, in order to really do it, you've got to break out GeoPandas and some you know, Python and stuff to get the right answer. Uh, I took the GeoJSON that ChatGP generated. I'm actually surprised that this is like in the right area, but, <laughs> but it's not exactly what we want. You see the, the bottom there, there's a weird rendering, and that's because the, it's got a twist in the polygon, like it crosses itself. So like a lot of things, in programming, directed graphs are the solution. So if you're not familiar with directed graphs, it's nodes and edges representing data or operations that way. So if you have 
you're like on Facebook and you've got friends and friends of friends, that's all represented as a directed graph. And we use that same approach for representing spatial operations. When a user says within 10 kilometers of the coast of the Iberian Peninsula, it's almost like pseudocode. They're saying, I want a buffer of 10 kilometers around the coast of this area. And so we can represent it as this graph you see here. And executing the graph, we start from the bottom of the tree. We do a lookup in Nominatum. We look for that area that they mentioned. Then it's all spatial programming, so we can calculate the, the coastline of that and then add a buffer to it. The coastline is just going to be a single line. So if you're searching for things along the coast, like you want to find houses or something like that, then that's where that comes in handy. Going back to our more complicated example from before, within a few miles of Salt Lake City, West Valley City, and Mill Creek, except for the airport, it looks like a tree like this. So at the bottom, the, the it might be a bit small or hard to read. The bottom, we're doing three place lookups, and then we're going to get the union of those cities, combined area, and then we're getting the, the difference. So we're doing like sort of spatial subtraction, chopping out the airport, and then adding a buffer on at the end. So we know how to represent user requests in a piece of data that we can execute. How do we actually get that? So one of the things LLMs are really good at, or I guess the main thing, is generating text. And specifically, they're really good at understanding JSON schemas and generating JSON that matches that. Uh, it's something that they've been like explicitly trained on. And so it's a common technique that you can use where you have some natural language text and you want to be able to pull out some information. You can express, like, here's the, the shape of the thing that I want to be able to pull out. Uh, create some JSON that matches that. And so we have a JSON schema that represents all the different kinds of spatial operations that you can do, place lookups and similar things. And the LLMs are pretty good at being able to take that and convert it into JSON. And so that's how natural language geocoding works. We take that user request or part of the user request that's the spatial area. We ask the LLM with the specialized prompt and it generates JSON for us and then we do the, you know, the calculations on it. Like anything, there's, there's challenges to making this work successfully. Um, one of the issues is finding the right thing in OpenStreetMap and finding like, things that actually have polygons. So if you look up like Sugarloaf Key, which is part of the Florida Keys, you will get an area back. But some of these like, larger areas that are more nebulous, like the Florida Keys, you'll look up and there will be an entry but it'll just be a single point. And it's, that doesn't work for us when we're trying to do something where if a user says they want some part of the Florida Keys. Uh, we also see this with things like Rocky Mountains, right? There's a single point in Wyoming for the Rocky Mountains for OpenStreetMap. Um, and other things uh, might be missing, like the Congo River Basin. Sometimes the, it's in there, we had the right the right information is in nominatum, like if somebody searches for Mississippi River, but the, you, know, you have to figure out which one of these entries is the right one. The first entry here that is a river is just this part of the Mississippi River. We have to be able to find the right one that's gonna give us uh, the Mississippi River. So I'm actually a new user to OpenStreetMap and nominatum. So I'm glad that I'm able to be here at this conference because I'm hoping I can learn from you about what is what are the better ways to use OpenStreetMap to help solve some of these problems? Another problem is, is ambiguity. When a user says something about Paris, they probably mean Paris, France, but there's a lot of places called Paris. There's a Paris, New York, Paris, Ohio, Paris, Kentucky, Paris, Texas. There's a place in Las Vegas called Paris. Uh, and we need to be able to figure out which one they mean. So let's talk through some solutions we've been thinking about to do this. So one, for, for understanding the, the terminology that our users are going to use for a particular domain, we can start to curate our own version of OpenStreetMap or the Nominatum. It's open source, so we can deploy it ourselves, and then we can go out and find different sources. And we've already been looking. There's a lot of great government sources you can find, like the Bureau of Land Management, departments, agencies, et cetera. Uh, I found a really great one, I think, just two days ago called Hydrosheds. So if I was looking for something like the Congo River Basin, it has 
things like that in there delimited. And I found some good ones like all of the coastlines of the entire world in a, in a repo in GitHub. So once we do that, that will work. And then you can also, depending on who we're deploying this for, if it's a real estate, if it's geologists, they may have their own terminology that they use for their own areas, and this would let us uh, be able to answer the questions using whatever they're going to use to refer to that area. Another thing we can do if for the ambiguous cases is use context. So if someone says, find me ice cream stores between Austin and Paris, you're on a road trip, they probably mean Paris, Texas, versus where can I get some Trabian ice cream in Paris? They probably mean Paris, France. And you saw this earlier. We did um, Salt Lake City east of the airport. I didn't have to code in anything special to be able to figure out what airport are they talking about. The general training of the, like, the large language models are pretty good at figuring out from context and giving it good prompts and, and working through optimizations. You can help solve some of those problems. The other thing we can do is ask the user. Like We can have a natural language conversation with the user. Or if the user asks a question like, how many Italian restaurants are there in Paris? We can actually ask them. The LLM can make a decision. Do I have enough information to go ahead and answer that? Or should I ask the user? What do you mean? Or we can display the answer to the user and make sure we're giving enough context so that we're displaying, OK, we're answering this question. Here's the spatial area. Here's temporal or other things that we're pulling out. And the user can see if it understood them. And they might say, like, oh, no, actually, I meant this and then we can adjust it. So we think natural language geocoding is just a part of a, like a bigger solution. Like we wanna be able to answer those questions I showed at the beginning. There's those parts that I underlined are the spatial parts, but there's other parts that we need to include too. And so we, this is a little hard to read here, um, but the user's asking a question, and this is a, a tool we built called Queryable Earth. They're, at, they're saying, show me algae within, uh, it's actually hard for me to read, within two kilometers of the coast of Cape Cod. Uh, so what we're doing is we're breaking that apart into different areas, and or sorry, I should say we're breaking apart that request into different pieces of information. So the thing that says uh, I'm looking for algal blooms or algae, we go to a vision language model where we've indexed all these areas previously, have taken satellite data and broken it up into chunks, and we're using the, the natural language geocoding to get the spatial area, and then we can go search a database with that. Um, and so bringing these things together is something like we're really excited about, and I'd love to hear more from you know, people here at the conference about ideas they have for natural language geocoding and use of generative AI in general. So thanks. I'll answer questions later, I think, because we're at time. But how well does, does geographic entity representation, or sorry, entity recognition do generally? It's pretty good, like because they've been, so the, the question was how well does it do, the LLMs do at uh, geographic entity? So if someone types in the name of an area, it tends, they tend to be really good because I, like they've been so well trained that, and they've been trained on so many different things and you know, different names that people have for different areas. And I'm prepping it in the prompt to say, like, here's your job, you know, like, you're answering these kinds of questions. They tend to be pretty good at it. But a lot of it is just converting it into a search into nominatum. And so that's where some of the challenge gets in is, like, getting the right thing out of nominatum. Hi. So you, you demonstrated uh, one of your slides, I think, a really great simplified workflow of hey, we've, we're using this OpenStreetMap data, we're using the large language models to kind of process the, the GeoJSON format, but then you've got the marriage between your database to give you accurate coordinates. I think it's really cool. Um, it seems like you're, not only are you using the LLMs, but you're also using some uh, computer vision models in order to answer the question about the algae. So my question is, which computer vision models are you using? Is it proprietary? Are you partnered with somebody else? Are they open source models? Um, what have been the challenges? 
And what are the LLMs that you're using? Because there's a variety now, and obviously everyone thinks ChatGPT, but we know that they're not the only one. Um, so which models are you using to help with this kind of uh, processing? So the question on which models are we using, for the, the vision model that I showed in that demo is called Skyclip. Uh, I believe that's the name. It is open source. And what it's been, what it's been, the way that it was trained is people took OpenStreetMap tags and satellite images, and they used data to, to train that so that when you, when you run that model on an image, it generates a vector embedding, which is probably too much for me to go into for everybody here. But we're able to also take text and pass that to the model as, and get back a vector embedding as well. And then we can do this semantic similarity search in the database to find images that are close to what the user wanted. I don't want to monopolize your time, but I have one more question, and that's it. So uh, one of the models that we were looking at for something similar, for, for image processing specifically that was open source, is a hugging face. So is that something that you guys have considered? Do you think that the sky clip is better? What are their pros and cons? Can you answer that question? Sure. Uh, well, Hugging Face is a, is a repo for models, and I believe Skyclip is in there. So Hugging Face has a bunch of different ones. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, you also asked about the LLM. For this, I was using uh, Claude 3. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Just on the geocoding, um, just wanted to ask is, uh, what, and I know part of this is probably related to the data underlying and what it's referencing, but um, I was wondering if, if it would be possible, like, to use your software with, if you had, like, a written description of, say, you know, something from a will or a deed or something like that, where you said, okay, the, you know, a property that has, starts on the, the southernmost point of this river and goes to this island or something, you know, if you had something like that, is that something that, that even could make a polygon for, or is that maybe, you know, is that too much? Yeah, uh, you can you can definitely do that, and that's something that people use LLMs for is like extracting information out of documents. And so we could use natural language geocoding in that way, if there was a description of a spatial area. So if I had an old treaty that said the territory surrendered was up to the ridge line of a certain mountain range and rivers. I could extract a vector line associated with that and tie it to the treaty? We would probably need to optimize it for that use case, but yes, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I could say the, the ridge line way up high and send that to nominatum, right? It yeah. wouldn't be able to answer that, but you could certainly do a focused version for that kind of a problem. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so hopefully folks are connecting the dots here, right? Because like um, old wills and treaties and stuff like that often reference historical uh, reference points also. Um, you're querying OSM. Maybe in the future we'll build up OHM to the point where you might actually need to or want to uh, consult both. So fingers crossed. Sure. So no questions? All right, I guess we're all hungry and it's time for lunch. So I'll see you later. <laughs>